Laboratory for the Integument. Learning Objectives for the Integument. 1. Be able to identify the strata comprising the epidermis of both thick and thin skin. 2. Recognize the morphological changes that occur in the keratinocyte as it passes through the various strata of the epidermis. 3. List three other cell types that also occur in the epidermis and understand their functional significance. 4. Be able to identify the, the two basic layers of the dermis and any associated subcomponents. And 5. Be able to recognize the appendages of skin and their structural subcomponents. Begin your examination by looking at a section of thick skin. A, thick, a section of thick skin is on the field of view. When beginning to examine any tissue or organ for the first time, always begin using the low power or scanning objective to course around and thoroughly examine the section at the lowest possible magnification to get bearings and many subcomponents can indeed be made out uh, by using the low power objective. In this particular section, which is thick skin taken from the palm of the hand or the sole of the foot, where this thick skin is located, one can see the epidermis, as indicated by the pointer. The external environment would be this space, uh, so this is the external surface, the epidermis covering the palm or sole of the foot, and you can see the thickness begins uh, about where the tip of the arrow is, where the keratin is, and goes to about this region as indicated by the arrow where the cellularity uh, stops. So course along examining this particular tissue. In addition to the epidermis, as indicated by the arrow, note the thick underlying dermis that is associated with it. Recall that this is a form of dense, irregular type of connective tissue, a very thick, interwoven connective tissue type that is extraordinarily tough. Now, as one courses along the tissue, several features can be made out even at this low magnification. For example, a tubular structure appears coursing across the field. This, in actual fact, is the duct of a sweat gland. It approaches the epidermis, enters here, and if one uses careful observation, the duct follows a spiral course through the epidermis, through the keratin layer, and then out and empties onto the external surface about this point. So this is the terminal region of a duct of an eccrine sweat gland. Another duct coursing in and out of the field of view is shown here, the duct of another eccrine sweat gland. As one courses along this tissue as it repeats itself, then go back and course more or less through the center of this particular tissue. Noting once again the very thick dermis. As we get onto the sort of the interior of the dermis and approach the hypodermis, numerous globs or pads of white fat will be observed. The secretory components and ductal components of a sweat gland, an eccrine sweat gland located here. Another is located here. Another shown there, where the tip of the pointer is. And note their association uh, with the fat in this particular area. Pads to give some cushioning to the soles of the feet and the palms of the hands. And these units repeat over and over again. 
and it gives you a good idea where to look at increased magnification to examine these subcomponents of thick skin in detail. Remember, the eccrine sweat glands are appendages and have grown out developmentally from the epidermis. Now, of course, again, a little bit deeper, just perusing the field. And lo and behold, coming into the field of view is an unusual type of uh, tissue. This structure here that looks much like an onion cut in section is one of the encapsulated nerve endings known as the Piscinian corpuscle. The nerve ending would be approximately here. This surrounding concentric layers of material is the encapsulation. So this entire structure here is one of the deep pressure receptors, a Piscinian corpuscle. We'll come back and examine it a little bit later after examining the section at low magnification. Lo and behold, a oblique or longitudinal section through another one of these Piscinian corpuscles. The nerve process area located approximately here. All of this material, as indicated by the form, uh, pointer, is encapsulated uh, material. My goodness, another one. Another Piscinian corpuscle located here. Again, cut a little bit uh, vertically or obliquely. And continue to course looking at the various uh, fat and sweat glands of this particular tissue. Having done so, then select an area of the epidermis and begin an examination, a detailed examination of it at increased magnification. A region of thick skin seen at increased magnification, looking specifically at the epidermis. The various strata can be visualized quite well. Beginning at the interface or the base of the uh, epidermis, with the dermis being located particular in this particular area, this single layer of columnar appearing cells is the stratum basale or the stratum germinativum. The cellular components that lie be just above the stratum germinativum or the stratum basale and occupy this particular region is the stratum spinosum made up of these little prickle cells. The third layer to be encountered as indicated by the pointer, the keratinocytes pick up granules, carotohyalin type of granules which sort of stay in a blue-black color. So this region has been named stratum granulosum. Immediately above stratum granulosum, and not very well shown on this particular section, is a sort of a loosener, or a lighter appearing area usually where the nuclei and granules disappear. Because of this phenomenon, it's oftentimes referred to as the stratum nucidum. And from this point outward is all keratin made up of squames, so this is all a thick layer of keratin much like a callus or uh, the much thicker skin one feels uh, on the palms of the hands or the soles of the feet. So, reviewing once again, you have these various layers made up of keratinocytes. The keratinocyte, this individual cell type here that forms the majority of the epidermis, begins as a columnar uh, appearing or shaped cell, lies on a basement membrane. And with time, probably 45 days or so, 
It releases from the basement membrane and begins a migration towards the surface. It begins to accumulate keratin filaments. Its shape changes, and as it approaches the surface, it starts to elaborate membrane uh, coating granules, which are not visible but yet present uh, within this layer. And as it approaches stratum granulosum, this keratinocyte continues to become more flattened and fusiform like. It accumulates the keratohyaline granules within its cytoplasm that are going to be involved in this keratinization process. They are then released or dissolved within the cytoplasm, and in that mixture with keratin, it becomes this shell or squame, uh, a little bag of keratin where these cells are so uh, firmly anchored uh, together to form this particular layer here. So these are the various layers of the epidermis and the metamorphosis, as you will, of a keratinocyte. This is that region of the sweat gland duct from an eccrine sweat gland. The lumen's located here. As it approaches the uh, epidermis, goes into the epidermis, as you can see. And then the keratinocytes themselves uh, sort of round up and whirl around where this duct courses through and finally uh, terminates uh, on the surface of that particular uh, uh, keratinized area. So this is what that ductal system looked like as it coursed through the epidermis at increased uh, magnification. Having looked at and identified the strata making up the epidermis, retreat back to a medium power objective and look at the interface between the epidermis and the underlying dermis. Note that within this thick epithelial covering, or the epidermis, you have numerous connective tissue extensions that push up into the undersurface of the epidermis. These areas that push up are called dermal papillae. And they function not only to house sensory nerve endings for very light touch, feathery light touch on the fingertips, but also all contain a very abundant vascular supply. Remember that the epithelial covering, that is the epidermis, is avascular and must rely on its nutrition by a diffusion. This is the mechanism by which the vasculature in this very thick epithelium, the vasculature can be pushed up and then diffused not only from this point into the tissue, the epithelial tissue, but also laterally. So it's a mechanism by which, with this very thick epidermis, its uh, nutrient uh, supply can be achieved. And you'll see these papillae sticking up into the basal surface of the epidermis all the way along. You get a little section such as this. This is simply another one of those projections, uh, the little papillar, papillary projections into the uh, epidermis, but cut at sort of an oblique angle. These are like finger-like extensions, so they're not uh, grooves that go all the way through. Uh, but they can be thought of as finger-like projections that extend up into the epidermis. So some come in and out of the field. Likewise, here we've cut two other of these dermal papillae, uh, and we're just not seeing where they're coming up and a complete vertical cut where they cut all the way through their long axes. Three additional of these dermal papillae extending up into the epidermis. 
and this feature repeats itself time and time again. Now occasionally one of these dermal papillae will contain another of the encapsulated nerve endings. This one, as I mentioned before, is for light touch, and it is an example of a Meisner's corpuscle. A very, very light, feathery touch, like if you're running your finger over the surface of velvet or fur or something like that, so one can perceive it, in contrast to the Pacinian corpuscle, which is a deep pressure receptor, as if you were leaning on your hand on a desktop uh, and feeling the weight of that. Examine one of these Meisner's corpuscles encapsulated nerve endings at increased magnification. A Meisner's corpuscle as seen at increased magnification. What one is visualizing actually is the encapsulation and not the uh, terminal nerve uh, process. Remember, these nerve processes are encapsulated. And what is seeing these cellular and fibrous details as they wrap and spiral around, uh, which would be like spiraling around the pointer in that direction. Uh, and within these spirals and within that light connective tissue resides a gelatinous jelly type of material to fill out that encapsulation. The actual nerve process lies right about where the pointer indicates, but cannot be seen uh, at this particular, in this particular uh, Meisner's corpuscle. Examine another one of these, find another one of these, and examine it in detail as well. They will all be located within these papillae, the dermal papillae that extend up uh, into the epidermis and are particularly prominent on the soles of the hands, or the soles of the feet, and the palmar surface of the hands. Another example of one of the Meisner's corpuscles uh, within the dermal papillae of the epidermis of the skin. Just the very top of this uh, Meisner's corpuscle has been uh, clipped. It should, they're sort of elongated football shaped structures. So we're just getting the top or the tip of this particular one. But what it does show is the spiraling nature of the encapsulation. So this is this connective tissue encapsulation. The nerve fiber would lie within the interior of this particular uh, uh, structure. Remember, in between the fibers and cells of this encapsulation is sort of a viscous jelly type of material uh, that also functions uh, in these mechano sort of receptors. This is an example of another uh, shown here as it spirals up into one of these dermal uh, papillae. So these are the Meisner's corpuscles sensory nerve endings, encapsulated nerve endings for uh, light touch. As we just examined a Meisner's corpuscle, perhaps was it appropriate that we went back and examined the Pacinian corpuscle at increased magnification. The nerve ending of this encapsulated corpuscle is right about where the tip of the pointer is. The encapsulation completely surrounds its uh, little nerve ending. And as I mentioned before, the overall appearance is very similar to an onion cut in cross section or in section. The interstices between the fibers and cellular components of this encapsulation like Meisner's corpuscle, is filled with a viscous uh, gel-like material. So these are quite large, uh, some reaching the size of the, uh, a match head, uh, and can be seen 
uh, visually with the eye. If this is one of the deep pressure receptors, a vicinian corpuscle. This is an eccrine sweat gland from the thick skin section seen at increased magnification. The ductal system is shown spiraling through here as indicated by the pointer. Remember, this is a simple coiled tubular gland. A cross section of this ductal profile is seen here as well as here and note that it is indeed lined by a stratified or cuboidal type of epithelium. So this is the same gland, several profiles of it. If you one thinks of a strand of spaghetti wound up on a fork and then sectioned, this is the type of profile one would uh, get in viewing a two-dimensional sections. This is the secretory unit or the secretory portion of that eccrine sweat gland. A section through that secretory tubule shown here, a profile through it here, a profile through it here, and one here as it uh, coils uh, throughout the field. Lined by a simple columnar light staining type of epithelium, for this is where the secretion is actually going to be elaborated. These empty space here are not spaces but fat cells where the lipid material has been uh, dissolved out. So this is a single eccrine sweat gland seen at increased magnification. Uh, the, probably the bottom part of the secretory unit is shown here as that tubule approaches the duct. It comes here will eventually join this ductal system which meanders out in this direction and then finally will head for the surface and the epidermis. So this is an eccrine sweat gland, both the ductal component and the secretory unit of this simple coil tubular gland. This is a section of thin skin Notice that the epidermis, as indicated by the arrow, is much, much thinner. Therefore, it is referred to as thin skin. Only a small, flaky amount of keratin is present. The underlying dermis, again, made up of dense, irregular type of connective tissue, is quite thick. Individual eccrine sweat glands also are observed. Once again, coarse along this particular tissue, noting various differences in the uh, substructure. Once again, they have a very thick dermis. This particular portion of the dermis is referred to as the reticular layer. So the arrow indicates roughly that region of the dermis referred to as the reticular layer. This is a very heavy, dense, interwoven mat of dense irregular connective tissue and in animal products is where the leather products are, are made from. Another region of the dermis has been defined as indicated by the pointer that goes up and is associated with the little papillae that are, can be seen. This is referred to as the papillary layer of the dermis and is made up of, has more ground substance, the fibers are much more uh, delicate and fine in nature as compared to the rather robust larger collagen fibers uh, of the reticular layer. Likewise, there are more reticular fibers within the papillary layers, whereas the reticular layer is made up primarily of type 1 collagen. Uh, more eccrine sweat glands also in the field located usually just beneath the reticular layer of the dermis. The two regions of the dermis, the uh, 
papillary layer and the reticular merge. And so an arbitrary line is just drawn, uh, and one can visualize it here pretty well because it's sort of an oblique section, the reticular layer with the more coarse fibers, and then the finer felt-like uh, fibers making up the connective tissue fibers making up the uh, papillary layer. And these units will repeat uh, over and over again. Once again, we see an eccrine sweat gland and its duct coursing towards the surface, but in this particular case, it goes out of the field of view. And as one would expect, this continues to repeat over and over again. So examine now the epidermis of thin skin at increased magnification. A region of thin skin seen at increased magnification. The epidermis extends from here where the tip of the pointer indicates to about here. A little bit of a folded section here, but it, the base of the epidermis is where the pointer indicates and it goes to about this level. The layers present and are much more difficult to distinguish on thin skin than thick skin is the first layer that's encountered as indicated by the pointer is the stratum basale or the stratum germinativum. There's a mitotic figure there indicative of this phenomenon. From that initial counter, that initial cell layer, the rest has to be stratum spinosum. All these prickle cells lying as indicated by the arrow. The next layer to be encountered is the stratum granulosum, as with thick skin, but in this particular case it consists of a single layer of cells with the keratohyalin granules. So in thin skin, the stratum granulosum is by and large a cell layer one or two cells thick. A stratum lucidum is absent, and this light flaky type of material is the keratin, the soft keratin that's exfoliating off from the surface. So thin skin, as its name indicates, is considerably thinner, consisting of a stratum basale, or stratum germinativum, a thicker stratum spinosum, which occupies this area, and a very thin stratum granulosum, and then finally uh, keratin, or the stratum corneum, covering the external surface. This is a section of thin skin taken from the thigh region of a black or a dark-skinned individual. Once again, the dermis can be seen uh, as indicated by the pointer and little dermal papillae. The epidermis obviously extends from where the tip of the pointer now indicates to the surface. And as one would predict, the same layers are present. A stratum germinativum or stratum base alley, a keratinocytes, which in this particular case have picked up and contain an abundance of melanin pigment. The stratum spinosum extends to about here, so from about where the tip of the arrow is indicating to about this level, and then one, once again you have a single layer of cells making up the stratum granulosum with the stratum corneum and the keratin being located here as indicated by the pointer. So the only difference is, is the abundance of melanin pigment granules taken up by the keratinocytes. These are not melanocytes. These are adjacent keratinocytes, particularly in the stratum germinativum, that have taken up and phagocytized the melanin pigment. Although it's difficult to be sure, small, clear, round cells like this may indeed be melanocytes, 
we would not have to have special histochemical staining methodology to demonstrate it specifically. But this does indeed appear to be a melanocyte, this light clear staining cell as shown at the tip of the pointer as, as this one uh, located here. This is a section of scalp. Examine it with the low power objective, noting several features that can be made out. The overlying epidermis is shown at the top of the field. It's fairly dark staining. And then one can also perceive the underlying dermis. Now, within the dermis, one should be able to locate and find Sebaceous glands, these simple branched alveolar type glands, oil glands associated with the skin. Here one is uh, saying the duct is located here, a single duct, and then some of its secretory alveoli uh, can be made out just here barely as they're uh, coming together. Remember this may have three, anywhere from three to five of these secretory uh, alveoli which will be filled with cells. Also associated with it and with most sebaceous glands uh, of the skin is a bundle of smooth muscle. This is the pilorector muscle. Uh, when it contracts it's always associated with a hair follicle. Uh, I don't know whether we can visualize it just barely on the edge of the field. It'll uh, unite with the external surface of a hair follicle. During contraction of this muscle and the pulling of the hair, this is what gives one goosebumps. Uh, it is the contraction of this particular uh, pillar erector muscle. A little bundle of smooth muscle associated with the hair follicle and usually underlying a sebaceous gland as is shown here. These oftentimes are are uh, grouped together and referred to as a pilosebaceous apparatus, which includes the hair follicle, this particular gland, as well as this little bundle of smooth muscle, the pillar erector muscle. Now also associated with this region of the integument, one should also find and compare eccrine sweat glands. Just a couple of profile or uh, sections through a tubule wandering uh, through this particular field. But one can see just by looking at the morphology there is no comparison with a simple coiled tubular gland as an eccrine sweat gland as compared to a sebaceous gland. Totally different morphological structures and differ considerably functionally. Continue on at, with the low power objective identifying sebaceous glands and their associated hair follicles and eccrine sweat glands as they come into the field. Here are visualized invaginations from the epidermis of hair follicles. Remember all of these structures are considered appendages of skin uh, the epidermis and developmentally grow out from it and remain continuous with it. Here we can see a, a portion of a sebaceous gland actually joining the uh, wall of this particular hair follicle. Another sebaceous gland. alveoli of sebaceous glands, a profile to the tubules of an eccrine sweat gland. Several alveoli of associated sebaceous glands, and this would be a section through an oblique section through an invaginating hair follicle. Another portion of a sebaceous gland, a portion of an eccrine sweat gland, pilar erector muscle 
located there going through the field. Now if we go a little bit deeper, hair follicle, actual hair shafts remains within its lumen. Down at the growing portions here, now down towards the root of the hair or near the bulb area with its surrounding fat. Another portion through a hair follicle as shown here uh, at its base. Developing hair and keratin here, the follicle surrounding it. Two adjacent hair bulbs and abundance of fat and more hair bulbs. So at increased magnification, examine the sebaceous gland, the sweat gland, and some of these hair follicles and the hairs in detail. One of the sebaceous glands from the scalp seen at increased magnification. Portions of the secretory units, that is the alveoli of this simple branched alveolar gland, are showing in the center of the shown in the center of the field, as has portion of another, and another one located here. And then if one courses upward a little bit, one runs into the duct of this particular gland, which is lined by a stratified squamous uh, type of epithelium, very thin, which will be then become continuous with the wall and empty into the wall of an adjacent hair follicle. Uh, part of that hair follicle is shown here. Careful observation will reveal that this particular gland is unique in that the proliferation of cells is toward from the base, where they're a little bit darker, more rounded, and up near the ductal system, uh, where it adjoins an alveolus. So the cells proliferate in this particular region, as indicated by the arrow, then migrate to the interior of this particular secretory unit and completely fill the secretory unit. As they migrate towards the lumen and towards the ductal system, they expand considerably in size, collect numerous small lipid droplets within their cytoplasm, and assume this frothy appearance. As they approach the ductal system, the nuclei become denser, become more pycnotic, shrivel and shrink, and eventually the cell wall or the cell membrane, the plasma lemma, breaks down and the entire contents, the entire cell, is secreted. And we can see that phenomenon uh, going on here. If we wa had some cells migrating from this unit, get larger, accumulate lipid, nuclei become pycnotic, cell membrane breaks down in the entire cell is secreted. So this is a classic example of a holocrine gland, uh, the sebaceous gland. So it could be considered as a, an exocrine gland, holocrine secreting, and it's classified as a simple branched alveolar type gland. This is the sebaceous gland of the integument. Examine a section of auxilla and compare apocrine and eccrine sweat glands that should be located in this particular area. Once again, look at the section with the low powered objective. Review some of the features that have already been examined. For example, the surface area or the surface of this particular region is covered by thin skin. Also demonstrated quite well because it's perhaps more of a uh, sort of a tangential section, one can e easily distinguish the papillary layer, this layer of finer 
caliber type of connective tissue from that of the reticular layer, which is this more robust, dense layer in which the fibers are much, much of much greater diameter than those in the reticular layer. Coursing down into the interior of the section, cross sections of hair follicles will be observed, as well as sweat glands. This is a fairly well developed eccrine sweat gland, as indicated by the pointer, a simple coiled tubular gland. Immediately adjacent to it are the much larger apocrine sweat glands. In this particular case, they are about three, four times as large, the lumina much more dilated, and the epithelium definitely lined by a tall columnar form. Another example of a apocrine type sweat gland. These are going to be found primarily in the axilla, or the armpit area, as well as the circumanal region. Another example of a single apocrine sweat gland. Another is shown here. The same tube cut several times in this very large simple coiled tubular gland. A portion of another apocrine sweat gland is here and compare it to the size of an eccrine sweat gland located at the arrow. So these very, very large glands or tubes within the field are examples of the apocrine sweat gland. And once again, we can compare from profiles, tubular profiles of an apocrine sweat gland with those of an adjacent eccrine sweat gland. Another site of comparison is sh shown in this particular field. An apocrine sweat gland located here, an eccrine sweat gland at this, in this particular field. Having once located these two types of sweat glands, where they are located within this particular section, then examine, in, examine them at increased magnification. Four profiles of an, the secretory tubule of an eccrine sweat gland. One profile is shown here, one is shown here, one is shown here, and one is shown here. So these are the, this is the secretory portion of an eccrine sweat gland, usually lined by a simple columnar epithelium, but because of their torturous uh, nature, uh, a good vertical cut is hard to achieve. The reason for this light salmon or pink colored is these tubules also are invested by a contractile cell known as a myoepithelial cell. The nucleus of one of these is located here. And this pink color is the result of these processes enveloping uh, these particular secretory units. Now, if one courses over and up a little bit in the field, a profile of the much darker staining ductal unit uh, can be made out as it courses in this particular area. And this unit will be lined by a stratified cuboidal type of epithelium. And the net concentration of nuclear profiles within this particular uh, portion of the uh, duct of a eccrine sweat glands accounts for its darker nature. Uh, two additional or three additional profiles are of the ductal system are shown here as well. Now, if one course is just a little bit lateral, these are the secretory tubules of the apocrine uh, sweat glands. Usually a very, very tall columnar epithelium uh, with the nuclei located towards the base. They too are surrounded by this layer of myoepithelial cells. Depending on how much material has been secreted, 
they can assume a more flattened appearance as is demonstrated here simply due to the accumulation of secretory material within the lumen of the tubule. But by and large, the vast majority of the secretory tubules of the apocrine type of sweat gland are lined by a tall, simple columnar epithelium, which is enveloped by the myoepithelial cells as well. And please do recall that these myoepithelial cells uh, reside within the basement membrane uh, of this epithelial uh, layer. The nucleus of one of these myoepithelial cells is demonstrated here. Having once looked at these various tubules of both types of sweat glands uh, carefully, attempt to find one that shows a little bit better than is demonstrated here some of the elements of the myoepithelial cells, that is their processes, cell body, and nuclei, and look at them at increased magnification. An eccrine sweat gland seen at increased magnification. The darker staining duct land by, lined by a stratified cuboidal type of epithelium they show coursing through the field in this direction. It then goes here, so a cross-sectional profile is viewed, and then over here. The secretory tubule of this portion of this uh, gland is shown in this particular field as it's much lighter staining. At increased magnification, and looking at this grazing section, one can see surrounding the secretory tubule processes of the myoepithelial cells. The nuclear, nuclear profiles of the myoepithelium are shown here, and these show those cytoplasmic arms wrapping around the secretory unit or the tubule itself. So these fibers have a spider-like shape, and they would be like tarantula spiders sitting on a piece of pipe or garden hose. So more of that tubule shown here. If we look at more of a cross-sectional profile of this eccrine sweat gland, these dark intensities that lie within the basal lamina or basement membrane are the processes of those myoepithelial cells wrapping around the secretory tubule as seen in cross-section and coming out toward the viewer. In this same field, perhaps, you get sort of a grazing section showing those ones that were demonstrated earlier. And then here we get a pretty good cross-section of several of them cut in cross-section as they wrap around and embrace the external surface of these secretory units. A small capillary shown here lined by endothelium. Examine the region of a hair follicle at low power and to review the various appendages uh, associated with the integument. The lumen of a hair follicle is shown roughly where the pointer now indicates. Trace it from the surface down into the interior or into the substance of the underlying dermis. So we are now tracing along a hair follicle. See that the epithelial, there's a continuation of the epithelium making up the follicular wall as the structure invaginates into the underlying connective tissue or dermis. This structure here that's bent and sort of falling out of the field is actually part of the hair shaft. As we course down, notice the epithelial nature of the uh, follicular wall. We now have a grazing section to it for just off center. Appearing in the field, alveoli of sebaceous glands, the sebaceous glands of which empty into these uh, hair follicles. Another sebaceous alveolus is shown here 
another one here. And if we continue from here over to here, we will continue to follow the hair follicle uh, into the dermis. Also coming into the field and associated uh, with this area, an acrine sweat gland, that simple coil tubular gland. And on this side, associated with this particular alveolus of a sebaceous gland, smooth muscle fibers in this little cylindrical uh, slip. That's the pillar erector muscle. And together with the sebaceous gland and the hair follicle, it uh, forms an organization known as the pilos uh, sebaceous apparatus uh, with the sebaceous gland producing sebum, that oily type of secretion, and the hair follicle elaborating uh, a keratinized tube, which is actually the hair. As we continue on distally, we can see there's a connective tissue organization appearing, so these follicles are enveloped in the connective tissue capsule coming from the dermis as well. And finally, as we're approaching the base, or the root of the hair, one can see it terminate in a, in a bulb-like structure known as the bulb of the hair. It shows a little bit better the connective tissue capsule. This is going to be well innervated as well with the little dermal papillae and its capillaries uh, forming the center. Uh, so supplying the nutrition and growth this region in here is referred to as the matrix of the hair, and even at this low magnification, one can make out several mitotic figures. So it's actively proliferating and dividing in this matrix region. And what will happen is the hair cells uh, from this matrix area will proliferate upward. It's still very cellular at this point. They undergo a process of keratinization, become more dense and uh, pycnotic in nature. And finally, the nuclei will disappear. And this sort of transparent type of region, even though it's a grazing section uh, going through it, you'll have a little cylinder of keratin, which is the hair itself. So it's very similar to what we saw in the epidermis, except with soft keratin, that keratinization process. The same process appears to take place here, where it's, uh, the hair starts off as a very cellular type of uh, uh, structure, and then undergoes this process of keratinization. But in this particular case, rather than flaking off in squames or little sheets or layers, it is organized into a cylinder and actually makes that cylindrical unit referred to as a hair. This structure here, making up the follicular wall, is referred to as the epithelial root sheath. You know, we don't need to go uh, into it in a great deal of uh, depth. It has both an inner and outer uh, region, an inner epithelial root root sheath and outer epithelial root sheath, and these correspond to the layers of the epidermis. The outer epithelial root sheath would be equivalent to the stratum spinosum and the stratum uh, basale, or the stratum malpighial area, and the inner root sheath is sort of equivalent to uh, stratum granulosum and the uh, uh, cornified layer on the in interior surface. The field shows an additional hair follicle, with the papillae being located where the arrow uh, is demonstrating, and the outer portion of the bulb also indicating, uh, indicated by the position of the arrow, with this specific region of that bulb uh, forming the matrix, or the growing portion of the uh, hair. If one proceeds up the shaft of the uh, growing follicle, uh, just a little ways, or a little bit, one can make out the various subdivisions of these various uh, elements making up the follicular wall. 
of this hair follicle. This area here is a connective tissue sheath that surrounds the uh, hair follicle. This homogeneous region is referred to as the glassy membrane. It corresponds to the basement membrane of the epidermis. Remember, the hair follicle is an invagination from the epithelial or uh, epidermal surface. This region here, this group of cells or this layer of cells, as indicated by the pointer, is the outer epithelial root sheath and corresponds to the stratum uh, melpigial layer of the epidermis, that is the stratum germinativum and the stratum spinosum. The inner root sheath lies from here to here and consists of specialized cells that corresponds to the stratum granulosum and corneum of the epidermis. This sort of light homogeneous area here is referred to as Henle cell uh, layer. Uh, it's usually described as being somewhat clear. Uh, here it is picking up the red dye for some uh, reason. The next cellular layer is this one with the nuclear profiles being located scattered along. It is characterized by trichohyalin granules. They're sort of similar to the keratohyalin granules of the epidermis, <coughs> excuse me, uh, but are different in their amino acid composition. So these, this layer here is referred to as Huxley's layer of cells and is characterized by these trichohyalin granules. This region here of this inner epithelial root sheath is going to form the cuticle of the uh, uh, root sheath or the follicle. This substance here is referred to as the cortex of the hair. So these are the keratinocytes that are growing up in this tube that will undergo complete keratinization and eventually form uh, that tube of hair or tube of keratin known as hair. Now if one goes up just a little ways, one can see the cuticle, which is uh, sort of interesting of lining both the hair itself and as well as the follicle. This little cuticle consists of a single layer of flattened squames or cells. In this particular case they overlap from below upwards so you can see a little sawtooth uh, nature. Uh, an interlock with the cuticle of the follicle which overlap from above downward. You can see this little sawtooth uh, uh, projections of these squames just off the tip of the pointer. Let's look at these briefly at increased magnification. The edge of the hair shaft seen at increased magnification illustrates the very thin flattened squames making up this cuticle on the hair shaft. So these are flattened squames that overlap from uh, below upwards and gives you this little sawtooth pattern uh, on the external surface of the uh, hair itself. These are keratinocytes that are undergoing keratinization. You can see some of them are pigments. So this is the cortex of the hair. We have a grazing section through it. We then pass through it once again and you can see these flattened cuticle cells on the external surface of the uh, uh, hair shaft on this side. And then if we focus perhaps a little bit, we can see the corresponding cuticle, uh, uh, another flattened cuticle uh, layer, but this time lining the follicle that are orientated shingle fashion uh, from below downward, or from above downwards. You can just barely perceive uh, sort of the sawtooth pattern that gives you an indication of these cells. Just an interesting feature of how some of the uh, hair shafts are, are interlocked and related to what's producing them, uh, that is the hair follicle.